205 Shaw Prize Lecture in Astronomy. The Shaw Prize is widely known as the Nobel Prize of the East. Today, we are very honored to have the two 205 Shaw Prize laureates in astronomy, Professor Jeffrey Marcy and Professor Michel Mayor, to speak to us. We've just learned from the video about them and about their distinguished careers. Now, may I invite Professor Yokshi Chen, the Vice President for Academic Affairs of our university, to say a few words of welcome. Professor Mayer, Professor Masi, colleagues, uh, friends, and students, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you to today's Saw Prize Lecture in Astronomy to be given by Professor Michelle Meyer and Jeff Masi. They will be speaking on a most exciting and tricking subject, the discovery of exoplanets and the possibility of life beyond our solar system. I'm sure many of us have gazed into space at one time in awe of the immense universe and contemplated whether any other life form are out there. Thanks to the achievement of these two great scientists, we now have a chance to find out. Professor Maya and Marcy are the joint winners of this year's Saw Prize in Astronomy. Only 10 years ago, the first planet outside the solar system was detected orbiting a sun-like star. Since then, Professors Meyer and Marcy have characterized the orbits and masses of planets around other stars and revolutionized our understanding of the processes that that form planets and the planetary systems. I expect the brief synopsis of their work will raise many questions in our minds. How did they discover these planets? How do the planets compare to Earth? And what does this discovery say about extraterrestrial life. Professors Meyer and Marcy will be shedding light on these important questions. And I'm sure all of us will come away from the lectures both informed and inspired. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm most honored to present to you two outstanding scientists, Professor Michelle Meyer and Professor Jeff Marcy. Thank you, Professor Chen. To show our appreciation to our two distinguished uh, speakers, we have prepared for each of them a small souvenir. May I first invite Professor Jeffrey Marcy to come forward for the souvenir presentation. Thank you, Professor Marcy. May I now invite Professor uh, Michel Mayor for the souvenir presentation. Okay, thank you, Professor Mayor and Professor Chen. Uh, could Professor Mayor please stay behind? The lecture will now begin, and Professor Mayor will give the first presentation. So, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I would like to discuss and present a few things about uh, this new world, this exoplanet. This planet orbiting other stars and frequently similar to our sun. Uh, in fact, we don't, do not have at all, uh, we are not the first to discuss this kind of matter. Already 
more than 2,000 years ago, a uh, Greek philosopher was discussing of the problem of the plurality of worlds, the fact that other worlds could exist in the universe. And uh, in a letter to Herodot, the Greek philosopher Epicurus mentioned that his strong feeling that an infinity, infinity of worlds should exist in the universe. So it's very strange to see this kind of, of precursor in, the, in this domain. And you, uh, uh, jumping about 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years, uh, we arrive to the time of the 16th century, at the time of Giordano Bruno, and you have this, uh, it, it was a, uh, uh, a religious man, it was not a scientist, and, uh, but he had, for the first time, an absolutely clear view of, of the position of stars and the sun and the possibility of planets. He expressed this in a book, and he said the stars are suns like our own one, and of these stars freely distributed in an unlimited space, surrounded by planets like the Earth, populated by living species, living beings. You see that, it, it's that only a few years before this uh, statement, in fact, uh, it was the time of Copernicus, where it was the time uh, we, we placed the sun in the middle of the solar system. And, it was, and during the whole antiquity, uh, stars was believed to be at a fixed distance on Earth on a, a sphere. And one of the most important st uh, s statements also is the last sentence, the sun has no central position within, within the universe, infinite universe. And this was extremely shocking for the time because all the philosophy was uh, putting the Earth in the middle of the universe. And the modern cosmology is uh, using a lot this statement. So, if you have a fine weather and you can see the star and the, we and the sky, maybe you have a chance to see this. So you can look stars in the sky. And if you are not in the middle of Hong Kong, maybe you have a chance to see the Milky Way because it's, a, it's relatively diffuse light. It's not evident to see if the, light is, uh, if the sky is too bright. So this, during uh, all the antiquity, people have only this aspect of the sky, and nobody knows the distance of stars, what was the stars, what, what is really this diffuse light. And already uh, at the very early beginning of the uh, 17th century, with a very modest uh, lens, uh, Galileo was able to, to resolve the Milky Way and detect that the, the, Milky, was a, the Milky Way was only uh, the, the superposition of a, a multitude, an infinity of stars, like we have on this picture. So you see that stars, objects similar to uh, the Sun, are absolutely in a very, very large number in the Milky Way. And modern astronomy in the, during the 20th century, people have been able to to reconstruct, to understand what was the structure of the Milky Way. Evidently, this is not our own Milky Way because we not, do not have the possibility to, to take a picture of it. We are embedded in this Milky Way. But if you are looking at a system similar to the Milky Way, you can see this is very huge structure of galaxies. And you have to, to, to understand that these systems have something like 200 billion of stars similar to the sun. So stars are very, very common in the universe, but it's still worse, it's still more. If you are looking in a very small part of the sky with a spa the space telescope, and you are taking a very, very long exposure, like was done by Bob Williams about 10 years ago, and in a small part of the sky where you do not have any stars, any objects seen from the ground, at the end of this long, long exposure, in fact, it's not one single exposure, but it's uh, several uh, uh, co-added later, you can see that he discovered 2,000 equivalent to the Milky Way on a very small part of the sky. So if you consider that each of these objects is something similar to our own one, 
with maybe 200 billion of stars, you see that the number of stars in the universe is absolutely fantastic. And evidently, immediately arrives the question, if we have other worlds, this is old terminology, do we have other planets, we would say today. It's strange, because if, in the antiquity, Epicurus was convinced of the plurality of worlds, in the 16th century, Giordano Bruno and others expressed also their feeling of the plurality of worlds. It was not so the case until recently. This diagram shows the logarithm of the number of planetary systems estimated by famous astronomers of the 20th century. And this during the only the period covering the 1920 to the 1960. Uh, you see Sir James, Harold Chaplet at uh, Harvard, you have see uh, uh, Russell here in the 20s, estimate that we were almost alone in the, U in the Milky Way. So part of the 200 million stars in the Milky Way, these paper, people estimated that uh, we do not have any chance to have other planetary systems in, in the Milky Way. And suddenly, in the 40s, you see the same surgeons appear here, uh, but you have a jump of, of a factor 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11. So from it's, uh, the, the feeling we have today, before the discovery of the, of the planet, that planets are really frequent in the, in the universe, or at least in the Milky Way. It's only uh, 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 an idea uh, from the last 50 years. And you see that we are here at the level of, of, of 10, bi 10 billion, 11, uh, 200 billion, or something like this. So, so it's, uh, uh, from the 40s, people consider that planets are extremely frequent in the galaxy. So if we go back to our own galaxy, modern telescope could easily uh, uh, have a very nice view of what is called the interstellar matter. So gas inside stars. And sometimes you can see beautiful clouds of interstellar matter. These clouds could be extremely massive. When I say massive, it could be something like uh, 100 million, uh, no, 10 to the 5 uh, solar masses. So it's very, very massive uh, cloud. And some, sometimes, due to the gravita gravitation, you have a collapse of this cloud and formation of new generation of stars. And here you have the Orion Nebula, and this region known to have something like uh, new, new stars with uh, an age of maybe few million years. So few million years, it's very young stars, because if you consider that the, star, the sun is uh, has an age of 4,600 uh, oh, 4, million years, so 4 billion years. So these stars are much, much younger than our sun. And again, 10 years ago, the, spa uh, the Hubble Space Telescope did this uh, very nice picture of these young stars in front of the Orion Nebulae. And what was the, the, the most important point of this picture was the fact that most of them were surrounded by disks of gas and, and dust. And why I, I, I show this picture? This because this is the location of the formation of planets. Because I, uh, the, the formation of planets, according to our current view, is just an agglomeration of dust particles and ice particles and growing and growing and growing and finally forming planets. And you see that at the opposite of the view at the beginning of the 20th century, now we know that every star at the, at, at the birth has the good condition to form planet. And this is the basis of the, our present feeling that we can find any uh, very frequently planets around as the stars. And in fact, the, the theory, the, the, the first step in the theory of the formation of planets by this agglomeration process was uh, proposed by Viktor Safronov uh, 40 years ago. And evidently, after a lot of people have contributed 
to the development of this theory. Uh, just to have a look in the future, presently uh, a huge project is uh, in construction north of Chile at a level of 5,000 meters on an altiplano uh, in a very dry uh, region of Chile. And this is a joint project between the uh, US and Europe with so some co other contributors like Japan, for example. And, and the goal of this instrument is to, to have a much, much nicer and more precise view of the disk of we have seen before. To understand the formation of planet, we, we need to, to get more information on this disk. And this will need, we will need maybe 10 years to build this instrument. So going back to, to the discovery of exoplanet. So if we are so convinced that uh, it's easy, to, and it's, uh, we have a lot of exoplanets surrounding all stars, it's, it's easy to, to take a big telescope, look the closest uh, or closest neighbor and see if we can see planet. But in fact, it's much more complicated like this because you consider that in our solar system, the contrast between the light emitted by, by the sun and the light reflected by the largest planet, Jupiter, is one billion. So if you are looking at another star with another planet, you will be completely dominated by the light of the star. So no chance to, to, to directly, simply look on, on planets. So this is a, a, a sketch to, to show this point. Here you have the wavelengths, here you have the, the sunlight, this is a logarithmic scale, and you have all the, the planets of the solar system, Jupiter, Earth, and so on. So you see you have a huge factor of one billion. And uh, you can have another idea. And this was uh, explored during the late uh, the last century. It was to just to imagine that if you have a, a star here, you have a planet here. The planet is turning around the star. And so you will have a small gravitational pull. And you will see the star moving around the gravity center. And you see that here is your gravity center. The planet is turning like this. The star is like turning like this. But as the star is much heavier than the planet, evidently the motion of the star will be extremely small. And, but let's imagine you have a huge, uh, an eye with a huge accuracy, huge resolution power. You will see maybe all stars moving a little bit in the sky. But unhappily, it's so small so for the time being, this is not really a uh, method having produced detection of planets. So what, how we have been working ourselves. If you look in detail the spectra of a, uh, the spectrum of a, of a planet, the, you have the different colors, but if you look in detail with a spectrograph, you will see that it's a forest of atomic transition with evidently very precise frequency known from the laboratory. So all the trick will be to determine the velocity of the star, the change of the velocity of the star due to the, uh, due to the Doppler effect. So you will, if the star is moving, you will see some oscillation of this forest of line. Evidently, as the planet is very small, very light, we will have a very, very small shift. And this is all the difficulty to detect planets. Just to have a comparison, Jupiter creates a motion of the sun with a velocity of 12 meters per second. The Earth will only imply a motion of 8 centimeters per second. So you see the, la the, uh, the, the Earth is very, very small rock. Uh, disturbing very small, uh, very, uh, very smally, so creating very small motion of the sun. So, in uh, we have built an instrument with the sensitivity to detect this small wobble of the velocity of stars. And uh, 12 years ago, with Didier Kelo, at the time it was uh, one of my students, uh, we have started a systematic search. For to, to, to analyze this small change of the velocity of, of stars. At the time, the precision was not so, so good as we have today. 
And the, f the big surprise was very soon to discover the change of the velocity of a star, a star very, very similar to our sun. So if you have the velocity here, here you have the time. You can see sometimes the, uh, the star is moving in your direction, sometimes it's going away, and so on, and with a period of only four days. And this was a big surprise, because in the, in the, galaxy, in the solar system, we do not have any planet similar to, to, to this kind of planet. I, uh, let's imagine, this is a sketch, it's a, it's a, it's a picture. It's not a real uh, uh, observation. You have here a uh, drawing with uh, something similar to the sun, and here you have the something similar to Jupiter, and you can see that we can imagine a planet extremely close to the surface of the star. So this was absolutely unexpected at the time, and uh, if we give just hints of how it is possible, that in fact people have discovered that uh, at the time we have this disk of dust and gas, in fact we have uh, some interaction between the young planet and the disk. And the interaction will create some kind of huge agg agglomeration of, of dust and gas in the disk. And by reaction, this agglomeration will change the orbit of the young planet. And finally, the planet will move like this, spiraling in and approaching the star. And evidently, it's still uh, comp not completely understood because we have to understand why we stop at some point, why the, the planet is not embedded in the star, and so on. So, but this is the basic physics behind to explain this kind of short period planet. So this was the first discovery. A completely unexpected domain of period for planets. The second point was the discovery of eccentricity. You know that the orbits of all planets in the solar system are almost circular, at least for the largest ones, uh, the giant planets. And at the opposite, what we have discovered with uh, all these new exoplanets is objects mostly, for most of them, on, ex uh, on eccentric orbit. Why the solar system is not similar to the majority of the system we observe? Here you have, again, the velocity versus time, and you see that we do not have this smooth change of the velocity typical of, of circular orbit, but you have this strong uh, uh, acceleration when we are going close to the star. We have continued the search after the discovery of the first one uh, at Old Provence, and we have discovered something like 20 planets in the northern hemisphere. Then after we have built a sec a new instrument and a small telescope, only 1.2 meter telescope in the southern sky in, uh, in Chile. And with this, we have discovered more than 40 planets uh, with this object. And two years ago, we have built a new instrument uh, installed on the 3.6 meter telescope also in Chile. And here, I believe it's incredible precision we have we have a precision much better than one meter per second. So we have the capability, the possibility to detect much, much lighter planets. In fact, for the time being, we start to be more limited by the stars themselves than by the instrumentation. Because when we are saying that we are measuring the velocity of a, of a planet, uh, of a star, in fact, we have to be careful that the uh, a star, you see the, here is a, a picture of the sun. It's something not very, very smooth. You have spots, you have a lot of uh, magnetic field. And when the star is rotating, this introduces some kind of noise on your measurements. And uh, finally, we have to take into account this, uh, this kind of, uh, of, 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 of phenomena to, to when we are searching for planets. But nevertheless, we are working, doing well. When I do we, it's Jeff and myself, uh, my collab our collaborators. That here you see the mass of the planet detected as function of years, except a few strange objects discovered by around neutron stars. 
you see that after the discovery of 51 peg, you have a huge number of discovery having been done, some more than 150. And you see that the mass is smaller and smaller. And this do not rea reflect the reality of what exists, but only our ability or capability to detect objects lighter and lighter. And now we are at the level of the mass of Neptune or less. Just one example of this detection. Uh, one year ago, last year, we have, been, uh, we have observed a star called Muara, known to have a planet. This is a drift due to a long period planet. And with this new instrument in Chile, we have done very, very nice measurements. And just have a look on this part here. And we have detected a second planet uh, with only a mass of 14 times the mass of the Earth and with an incredible precision of bet half meter per second. So you see that we are approaching the possibility to detect very, very low mass planet like the mass of the Earth. I will go back to this problem later. Not only we have seen the the diversity of exoplanets in domain of period, in domain of eccentricities, absolutely not what we have in our own solar system, but we are discovering multiplanetary system. I will not extend a lot of the discussion on that. I will just show one example of also a kind of system we do not have in the solar system. It's called the resonance system. Sometimes we have discovered systems where one planet is doing one turn in 200 days and another one is doing a turn in 400 days. But they are exactly locked together by the gravitation and you have a strong resonance and this will continue for, for a very, very long time. So the goal is to go in direction of very low mass object. And as you have seen before, the search using radial velocity will have really difficulties, if not if it My is not impossible, to to detect a real Earth type planet. Because eight centimeters per second, I believe, are out of the possibility of the Doppler search. So happily we have other possibilities. If this idea came from the fact that we observe very short pe period planet. If you have a star here, you have a planet very close, we have a good chance that sometimes the planet will go in front of the star. So in such a case, you cannot see evidently the disk of the, of the star. You, so you, can, you will not see this phenomena. But if you are measuring precisely the luminosity of the star, you will see a small drop when the planet is going in front of the, of the star. So you, using only a measurement of the luminosity of stars, you will have the possibility to detect planets. Five or six years ago, uh, we have discovered a planet with a period of 3.5 days. So immediately you see, oh, short period, maybe uh, we will have a chance to observe a transit. And so you can predict from the radio velocity the time at which we have a chance to observe the transit, the eclipse. And this was a good candidate. And already the 9th of September, you have a, small, a very nice drop of about 1%. And 1% corresponds to a radius of 10% for the planet. So, and uh, seven days later, you have the same phenomena. And here you have the combined curve. And it's very nice because you still not have seen the planet, but you know its mass. It was 0.7 times the mass of Jupiter, so smaller Jupiter. And a little bit larger, 1.4 times the mass of, uh, of Jupiter. So you can determine easily the mean density. 
And so you have a proof, a direct proof, that it is really Gaza's giant planet. So this was, I believe, a very critical step uh, in the process of discovery of exoplanet, because to really prove what we have discovered is not something unusual, but it's really planets. And evidently, after this success uh, coming from these new techniques, a lot of people around the world have started similar work. And uh, they observe systematically with CCD some very dense field of the, of the Milky Way. And just, for example, during three, three months, they are doing every 10 minutes one picture, one picture, one picture. And then after with huge uh, uh, tools, uh, algorithm, and so on, sometimes they detect some small drop. And so they have the possibility to detect planets. So when you have detected the drop, you don't have the mass. So with my collaborators, we are now using the VLT. It's a, it's a very big telescope. It's a set, in fact, a four, eight meter telescope in the desert of Atacama to measure the velocity of this object. And so now we are in position to, to do some physics on this object. For example, for, for example, here you have the radius of planet versus of objects versus the mass in logarithmic scale. And what we have observed, these are stars and these are planets. And you can see here that already we can start to do physics of, of this object. We still not have seen this object, but we are already have the possibility to do some physics. A second very uh, strange fact you can see from this diagram, that you can see that you have objects here, a very small stars with the same diamet diameter than a, a planet despite the fact that mass is a factor 100 between both. So as you see, you can have very small, plan uh, very small stars with exactly the same size as big planets like Jupiter. So the goal is to search planets like this. We would like to, to explore the domain of terrestrial planets. But as I said, it's not so evident because the size of the Earth is one hundredth of the size of the Sun. So the, if you have an eclipse of the Sun due to the Earth, we will have a drop of 10 minus 4 of the luminosity. So detect 10 minus 4 from the ground is really, really difficult, if not impossible. But happily, space uh, research will help for that. And this is the same stars as shown before, the same uh, transit uh, we observe from the ground. But here, this corresponds to about 1%. In fact, 1% is here. So what we have to do from space is to detect drop 100 times smaller than this. But in, in principle, this is feasible from space. And today, two space missions are currently developed, one by the French agency and the other one by NASA, and to be launched in the coming years. And several objects are expected to be detected, and few of them will be in the range of terrestrial planets. And so this will be the start of the physics, of the discovery period of real terrestrial planets. Not only we are just at the, at the border of the discovery period of terrestrial planet, but a big challenge is to try to do images. Uh, at the present time, you can read in the literature the very first steps of discoveries of, uh, of images of exoplanet. This object is probably with a mass of something like f five times the mass of Jupiter probably formed by a different kind of mechanism, but you can see that we are just at the border of the possibility to do real images of exoplanet. 
But already today, people are dreaming, are starting to develop the, to de the design of a huge telescope. And this is uh, the top priority project developed presently by the European Southern Observatory, is to build a telescope of 100 meters. So you see that what was looks impossible only a few years ago start to be real uh, part of, of engineer studies. And uh, this kind of tool will be absolutely fantastic tool to try to do images of, of planets. It's not the only uh, possibility uh, explored by people. And a second one, in fact, started before, was to, to, to go in space and to try to, to answer the most <coughs> fundamental question is the problem of life in the universe. Because evidently, if we have so big interest in the detection of terrestrial type planet, is to have a chance maybe to answer this question. Uh, and evidently we can, it looks uh, that this question is too ambitious because we are just at the border to detect very big planet and we say, is it possible to detect life and life on small planets? So, so it looks a little bit too ambitious. And I will try to convince you that it, probably your generation will have a chance to, 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 uh, to find an answer to this question. So go back to, to the argument. Uh, what are the difficulties? Well, the, the planets are, are not producing energy. Stars are nuclear. Uh, producing nuclear power. Planets are only reflecting the light of coming from stars. And you have this huge ratio between the luminosity of planets and stars. So this is the first difficulty. We are always dominated by, if you are looking at another planetary system, we are all, always dominated by the light of, of the star. So the game will be to try to, to stop the light the light coming from, from the star, how to do it. So uh, one possibility is to go in space, to build a network of satellites. And I will try to convince that we can do interesting things with this. But as I have only two hands, I will uh, imagine to have only two satellites. You have two satellites looking at the same time, the same star. And as you know, that light is an electromagnetic wave. So this, telesco this telescope will register a wave like this. And you, you try to fix the distance between these satellites in such a way that the waves detected by the other one is exactly the opposite. So if you then you take the light coming from these two satellites in the middle place, what you will have, you will have the sum of this signal plus this signal, and it's nothing. So it's absolutely strange to imagine that you have two telescopes, you add the light coming from these two telescopes, and the result is nothing. And evidently, you can add more telescopes for, for some specific points. So with this design, you have solved the first difficulty is to stop the light of the star. But this, what is called nulling uh, condition, will not be satisfied if you are looking a little bit away. And this is exactly what you want, is to see planets. So you will have a huge resolution power given by the distance between satellites. But in addition, you will, have, so you will solve the problem of the excess of luminosity of the star. But evidently, you can imagine the complexity of this instrumentation, uh, the cost, evidently, of this instrument. So if it's only to have one picture with a small dot, it's maybe not very exciting. So what is behind this experiment? In fact, what is behind is uh, an idea issued from old space mission having observed at some distance uh, these three planets, three rocky planets, very similar, three sisters, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They have been formed at the same time by the same process, 
have received an original atmosphere by the same process of bombardment of meteoritic, meteoritic bombardment. But today, if you compare the atmosphere of these three planets, you can see they are completely different. Mars and Venus have 96% of the atmosphere in carbon dioxide. The Earth is 0.04% of carbon dioxide. But you have a very strange signature in the spectrum, infrared spectrum of the Earth, is the fact that you have a strong ozone line or, uh, at 9.7 micron. And this is only because we have 20% of the atmosphere of the Earth uh, in, in terms of oxygen. And this is completely out of thermodynamic equilibria. In fact, it's absolutely not normal to have 20% of oxygen because oxygen is a very, very aggressive uh, kind of chemical. And if you imagine the, 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 the experiment to kill the totality of living species on the, on the Earth, bacteria, plants, and so on, only after 10 million years, we you will not have any more oxygen or in a very limited amount on, in the atmosphere of the Earth. And this signature will disappear. 10 million years is very short compared to the 4,000 million years of the life of, of a typical star. So if you observe another st planet with an atmosphere, with you can find other signature. With similar signature, you can say life exists on this on this planet. And this is the, the basic philosophy of this search, is not to send rocket to, to and to see if animal exist on planet, it's completely out of possibility, but only to, to look the, I would say, chemical anomalies in the atmosphere of planets. And maybe your generation will have a chance to finish, to prove what was said by Giordano Bruno a few centuries ago, because we still not proven this statement populated by living beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mayon. We can now take questions from the audience. Just to uh, make sure that everyone can hear the question, we have students uh, carrying uh, wireless mics. If you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, one of our students will come over to you. Your mathematical calculation and your research is very high tech, but this is only applied to the idea of Star War. This is the end result of self destruction. Why don't you use the money on the so so uh, to to make social justice? So, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure to have completely understood, but maybe you will correct me if I'm not answering correctly to your question. From where is coming the money to support all this research? Is it, it was a question. So uh, I, I'm not sure it's, uh, it was a question. If, it's, if it is a question, uh, you see that more and more, it's true that these experiments are more and more expensive, and they are most of the time out of the capability of, of countries. And for example, uh, in Chile, these huge observatories we have are built by uh, ESO. ESO is the European Southern Observatory. It's a club of 12 countries. And it's only because we have the, the, the collaboration of these 12 countries that we have the, the resource to build this, this kind of, of instrumentation. And I have shown the ALMA. It's a collaboration between uh, Europe and, and the US and Japan. And uh, I'm sure that all the big instrumentation in the future will be based on, on this kind of, of, of uh, uh, collaborations. Yeah, one question here, maybe.
So are you making an as assumption that living life is about carbon, water, and stuff like that? Can they be, you know, made of other particles or, you know, chemicals? So you may miss the chance to, you know, search other living things. Yes, it's a, it's a very fundamental question you are asking for. Uh, are we still uh, uh, biased in our view by the old uh, anthropocentric view that uh, and we are uh, believing that the, the carbon organic chemistry is necessary to, to any form of life? I cannot be sure of the answer of that, but uh, what we can say is that life needs to transfer a very complex information from one generation to another one. So you have to inv invent a, uh, a device to transfer a very complex information from one generation to another one. How a cell work, how is the cell divide and continue to, to transmit this information to the next generation. So this is a basic, very basic definition of life. So how you can store information? Okay, you can use a computer, but maybe it's not in the nature a very easy way to, to do it. So, so the only way we can imagine is long chain of, of, of atom. And how you can build long chain of atom, you need uh, an atom suitable to, to build this kind of complexity. Uh, and, and at the present time, carbon is, uh, is the most promising uh, candidate. And uh, the only one maybe uh, proposed to, to as an alternative was uh, silicium, but as a matter of fact, silicium is much, much poor in, in po possibility of complexity compared to the carbon. But I believe it's, uh, for the time being, it's the only uh, possibility w we can dream to, 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 to base uh, the chemistry on the carbon. And we are based on this. <laughs> but it's not a proof, I agree. That it's But maybe so, uh, looking first on the, uh, the most easiest one, but maybe it's not a, a full uh, uh, proof. If we do not find anything, it's not a proof that life do not exist. Hi, hey, Professor. Very interesting research here. Uh, I would like to know from, from now how many percentage of the planet we discover have a similar condition or chemistry component as Earth, how many percentage of the plant we have been discovered so far a similar condition with us? Thank you. Uh, similar to the Earth, no, no planet, because we have not detected any terrestrial planet for the time being. Uh, if we, we have kind of statistical arguments like the number of planets with a mass larger, let's say, uh, the mass of Saturn and a period less than the few years, it's few person, let's say five, ten person. So five or ten percent of the stars in the sky have planets uh, relatively massive, let's say, and with not too long period. Because uh, let's remember that in the solar system, you have planets with, with one century or more. So uh, it's evident, uh, Jeff and myself, we are too young. We have started only a few years ago, the, this kind of search. So we have not observe the full cycle of, of one century. So, so it's the reason why we still not have any knowledge of this very long period uh, object. And uh, so in terms of, of compo chemical composition, we, we know, we have observed that uh, stars with a very rich atmosphere in iron, in metals, have a large, much, much larger chance to have planetary system. It's a huge factor. So you see that we are just at the beginning of this kind of, of search. And, and the first step in, in the research we are going, we are carrying out, it's not really to, to detect life, because this will be uh, uh, f for the future. The present situation is much more to understand the physics of the formation of planets and, and in particular, the formation of our own solar system. I, I don't know if I fully underst understand. Yes. Uh, Professor. I'm, I'm very 
I'm very respect to your work. Uh, uh, but I want to ask, um, all up to now, all the evidence is about the mass panic. Is I I feel it's indirect evidence. So is there any other mechanism that can also cause that can also cause this shift in the Doppler effect? Mm. Cause this periodic change. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm not uh, discuss this kind of things, but uh, it's it's a it's a very evident point and question. The fact that we observe only something indirect. We are at the beginning during all these years. We have not seen the planet. We have only detected the change of the velocity. And are we sure that it is really due to planet? And it could be due maybe to pulsation of stars, or it could be due to spots rotating on the surface of the, of the stars. So at the present time, I believe we are absolutely sure that we are uh, observing planets. Because the pulsation of, of stars, for physical reasons, cannot be so long. This is absolutely impossible. Stars like the sun are pulsating, but with a period of about few minutes, five minutes. And it's absolutely impossible to create pulsation at the level of a few days or more. Uh, we can eliminate the problem of rotation for, for maybe two technical uh, points. And, and more fundamentally, what is, was the, the critical observation was the observation of the transit. And, and after the detection of the transit of this first planet uh, a few years ago, we are absolutely sure that uh, what, what we have observed. So, and, and you have seen the, sh the shape of the transit curve done by the space telescope is absolutely perfect. So it's, it's a, absolutely an incredible proof of this phenomenon. No, I believe we are really have planets. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe it's time to let a chance to Jeff to, com to, to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bayer. We welcome the second. Uh, we welcome the second half of the, uh, uh, the lecture. I would like to invite Professor Jeffrey Marcy to uh, make his presentation. Professor Marcy, uh, Marcy please. Well, I am delighted to be here today. Uh, this is my first week in Hong Kong, and I've traveled all around the island and up into the new territories, and I'm very excited to be here, especially because at uh, this university, so much new technology and new science is being developed, and I can tell that in the next uh, 20 or 30 years, some of the new technology that we will need to detect new planets planets and perhaps life in the universe will actually happen right here in uh, Hong Kong and perhaps at this university. Let me tell you a little bit about the research that uh, my team has been doing and then I'll talk about some uh, topics for the future. Uh, let me start by introducing you to my friends and colleagues that I work with. Uh, first is my colleague Paul Butler who has worked with me for 17 years you see him here looking like a Hollywood movie star. <laughs> uh, and then this is my colleague, Deborah Fisher, uh, who's made some very important discoveries in the last year and a half. You see her cradling the precious starlight that we use at the back end of the telescope. And then my other uh, collaborator <laughs> is Steve Vogt, looking like a magician. But actually, he's the one who designs all of the optics. 
the telescopes and the spectrometers that we use. So these three people are the ones who actually do the work while I just travel around talking about it. Uh, so let me remind you how we find planets. The technique is identical, essentially, to what Michel Mayor has already described. We cannot see the planet because it is too faint. So instead, we watch the star. And you can see very clearly. Oh, they're changing my microphone. I Here we go. Oh, yes, what a difference. You took, you took the best microphone. Oh, oh, he has it. He stole the best microphone. <laughs> so um, uh, the idea, of course, is exactly the same as before, that the star is what wobbles. So we actually watch the star, and we measure the Doppler effect of the star as it wobbles around due to the gravitational pull on the star by the planet. So that's the same technique uh, that you just learned about. Now, of course, it's the Doppler effect that we use. So as the star wobbles around, we occasionally see the star coming at us at the Earth, and the light waves are compressed uh, by the Doppler effect. And the other half of the time, the star goes away, so the light waves are stretched out. And so it's that alternating periodic change in the Doppler effect that allows us to de detect, infer the presence of this planet by the indirect technique that Michel Mayor described. Here's a, a movie that shows how this works. As the star wobbles, it's wobbling because of an unseen planet somewhere out here that we can't even detect. But the star wobbles, and the change in the Doppler effect moves the spectral lines to redder and then to bluer colors in sync with the orbital motion of the star, which in turn is in sync with the orbital motion of the planet that's pulling on it. So the technique is straightforward. We're using three telescopes in the world to do this. We started in California with the Lick Observatory, a, a three-meter telescope. Uh, we moved to the southern hemisphere using the Anglo-Australian telescope in Australia, which is a 3.9-meter diameter telescope. And now we're using the uh, world's largest telescope, the Keck telescope, which uh, most of you may know. The Keck telescope uh, here is located on the big island of Hawaii, uh, high atop a hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. So that's where we do our observations. Uh, of course, the heart of the matter is actually the spectrometer. At the back of the telescope, we take the eyepiece away and instead put a spectrometer. This spectrometer costs about $5 million to build, $5 US uh, million. Uh, and what it does is take the starlight that comes from the telescope, and the starlight comes down and goes through mirrors, diffraction gratings, and prisms, spreading the light out into all of its colors. And so it's this spectrum of colors that we record with a digital CCD, a digital camera. And it looks like this. When we go to the telescope, this is exactly what we see. But when we come back one month later, the star might have wobbled a little. It might have moved a little. And if so, the Doppler shift changes. And so we see this, a little shift. That's the Doppler effect. And then a month later, another shift. And it actually does move a lot less than that, but that's the idea. And so we watch for periodicity in the Doppler effect. And that tells us that the star is being yanked on periodically by a planet. So it's very straightforward. The software is quite difficult. This is one of our representative detections. This is a star you can see with your naked eye. It's in the constellation Cygnus, 16 Cygni. And this is velocity of the star over the course of time, 1996, 98, 2000, 2002. And each of the dots represents a separate visit to the telescope and a measurement of the Doppler effect. And you can see that you can connect the dots. They, they string along, making a periodic pattern over and over again. This will, of course, repeat essentially forever, for billions of years. This tells us there's a planet orbiting the star, yanking on it. You see the orbital period by eye. It only takes 2.2 years 
for the star to wobble once, and therefore the planet must be wobbling around the star. The planet is orbiting the star, I should say, taking 2.2 years. So we know that this planet takes a little longer to orbit the star than the Earth takes to orbit the sun. The Earth, of course, takes one year to orbit the sun. So from Kepler's laws, you can see, and even intuitively, you can see that this planet must reside farther from the star than the Earth resides from the sun. So you already can get a sense that we can measure the distance of the planet from the host star. Now, in addition, of course, we can measure the amount of wobble. This amplitude is quite large in this case, telling us that the planet must be so massive that it gravitationally yanks on the star, pulling it around with an amplitude, you see, of about 50 meters per second. So that tells us that the mass is quite large, in this case, about 70% uh, bigger than the mass of our own Jupiter. 1.7 Jupiter masses. And the other strange thing about this graph that you can see is an attribute that Michel Mayor mentioned, which is the strange shape. You see how the velocities ramp up, and then are, the star is jerked downward. And then the star changed its velocity slowly, and then the star again quickly changed its velocity. This tells you that the planet must not be orbiting in a circular motion, but instead in an elliptical elongated motion. And when the planet comes close to the star, it pulls very hard gravitationally on the star, yanking the star into a completely different velocity. And so we can build a computer model of this system. And here's what our computer models look like. Any of you could uh, write computer code to model this. Here's the star. And here's the planet orbiting around. And you see when the planet comes close, it yanks gravitationally on the star. And we can predict with the computer what the velocity of the star will be as a function of time. And so you can see the velocity ramps up slowly, and then the star is jerked downward. And the star is jerked downward just when the planet uh, passes close to the star. So it's very easy to build these computer models and simulate the data that we actually observe. And you can see this shape is theoretically the same as what we observationally uh, actually detected from the star. So that's the way it works. With this computer model, you can determine the shape of the orbit. Here's the star 16 Cygni. And then the shape of the orbit is this elliptical pattern like that. And by the way, in this case, for reference, I've put the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So indeed, this planet orbits farther out than Mars does from the sun. You might ask, what does this planet look like? And as Michel Mayor mentioned, we don't have any pictures of any of the planets. So we can only guess. And fortunately, we know the mass and the distance of the planet from the star. And because it's very massive, the planet probably is made of hydrogen and helium gas. So we can guess that these planets that are Jupiter in mass probably have a an appearance that is similar to Jupiter or Saturn. So this is what the artist thinks the planet looks like. Uh, whoops, I went past it. We think that the planet looks something like our own Jupiter. Here's 16 Cygni. It's actually in a binary system. There's 16 Cygni uh, B here, and there's 16 Cygni A. But this planet easily goes around like so. It may be that these giant planets we are discovering have moons and maybe even rings. We can't detect either one of them, but the artist, uh, with her license in her hand, has put in a depiction of a possible moon uh, for which we have no evidence at all. But if there were such a moon, <laughs> if there were such a moon, then of course this moon would be dragged in close to the star where any water on that moon would evaporate, and hence I've drawn this with the, the artist has drawn this with my oversight with a sort of comet tail depicting the loss of water. You might worry, therefore, that life as we know it that depends on water would have a difficult time getting started and flourishing on a moon that had no water at all. I'd like to show you my favorite planet 
uh, found so far. This is a star, Upsilon Andromedae. It is fourth magnitude. You can see it looking up in the night sky with your naked eye, even from central, I think. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, you can find this star in the night sky by noticing where the Andromeda galaxy is. Just go to the Andromeda galaxy, turn left, and you will come to this star. <laughs> You can, t you can tell this star from among all the other stars because it has a little arrow next to it there like that. <laughs> uh, so here are the data. This is velocity versus time, just as before. And now you see 1992, 94, 96, 8, 2000, 2002, 2004. These data points look like a mess, a complete mess. The analysis we do of these data is actually a Fourier analysis. We look for periodicities in the data. But an even simpler way to proceed is to just zoom in on a certain section. And if we zoom in on this section of data, you can see the velocities go up and down and up. And then here's another segment where it goes up and down. But the interesting thing is this zoomed region is only 70 days. So the orbital period of this planet that's yanking on the star, making it go up and down, the orbital period is only 4.6 days. That might ring a bell to you. That's the same orbital period that Michel Mayor described to you as the period for the planet around 51 Pegasi. And in fact, we have found many planets that orbit their stars in only a few days. So this is a planet very close to its star, just as 51 Peg B is to its star. Now, if that were all there was to this, this would not be my most favorite planet. But in fact, you can subtract the effects of this planet from the data that I already showed you. Remember the original data. Let's now subtract this sinusoidal curve from the original data. And this is what you get. These are the residuals, what's left over as a function of time. And you can see that the velocities still vary. They vary by going up and down, up and down, up and down, taking about 2 thirds of a year over and over and over again. The velocities go up and down with a period of 2 thirds of a year. So that means there's a second planet. But in addition, as you can all see, there's yet a third periodicity that takes three years up and down and up and down. So there is, in fact, a set of three planets orbiting this star that you can just see with your own eyes looking at the data. So there's the inner planet and then two successively outer planets. And here's a civil engineering sketch of the system. Uh, we know the masses of the planets and we know what their orbits are. The outer planet over here has a mass that's about four times the mass of Jupiter. This one here has a mass about twice that of Jupiter. And then this inner one, uh, 0 0.6 times the mass of Jupiter. I should stop here for a minute and mention something rather unfortunate. We don't have any names for any of our planets. You may have noticed that Michel Mayor did not mention any names for the planets. And uh, I don't have any names either. So uh, we are both looking for good ideas about names <laughs> for planets. Uh, so it's, it's a rather sad situation. Um, if you have suggestions, um, we, you should let us know. And uh, maybe we could name a planet after you if you'd like to make a donation to our planet <laughs> search. <laughs> maybe Sir Run Run Shaw would like to have his name on a planet. I don't know. Um, one thing I can mention, too, is that I do get uh, mail from uh, students, uh, young students in middle school and elementary school. Uh, and they send me notes, and, and they tell me what the names of the planets should be. And I got a note about two years ago about this system, Upsilon Andromedae. It was a girl 13 years old in seventh grade. And she said, uh, dear Professor Marcy, I just read in the newspaper about your three planets orbiting Upsilon Andromedae. She said, I don't know if you have any names for the planets, but I have suggestions. And she said, this one here. Uh, we should name, because it has four times the mass of Jupiter, she said to me in the letter, we should call it Forpiter. <laughs> and then this one, she said we should call that Tupiter. <laughs> and then this one, she told me we should call it Dinky. 
So people make up names, and they also tell me what the aliens look like that live on these planets <laughs> and what they like to eat. And by the way, all over the world, in South America, Middle East, Asia, North America, all of the children think that aliens primarily love to eat pepperoni pizza. <laughs> I don't know why that is. It's universal. Strangest thing. So, okay, so these, this is a triple planet system, and it's lovely because it reminds us of our own solar system with its nine or maybe even ten planets. Here's an artist's rendering of it. You see the star Upsilon Andromeda. Here's uh, Forpeter with a ring <laughs> for which we have no evidence. Tupiter and then Binky over here. Okay, so um, that's pretty exciting, but uh, a triple planet system would be nice if we could find even more planets around some of our stars. Here, by the way, is a graph showing the masses of the planets. Uh, this is a histogram, the number of planets we've found as a function of their mass, from 0 to 15 Jupiter masses. So this has units of mass of Jupiters. And you can see the beautiful result that Michel Mayor and I have both gotten, showing that there are more and more planets having lower and lower mass. There are more small planets than big planets, more Saturns than Jupiters, certainly more Neptunes than there are Saturns or Jupiters. And then it's anybody's guess as to whether or not this curve continues all the way to Earth-like planets. Probably it does, but we can't be sure observationally yet. There may well be many more Earth-like planets for all of the Jupiters that we have found so far. Now, the, the last planetary system I want to show you before I move to a different topic is this new one. This is a nearby star only 10 light years away, Gliese 876. And you see that the data points go up and down all over the place, and there's an outer envelope. So we first thought this star had only two planets orbiting. But if you have good scientific eyes, you can see that the data points here, these are the residuals now. The residuals scatter up and down, up and down. It's not a very good fit to the data. And the reason is, in fact, apparently there is a third planet in the system. And you can see that by doing a Fourier analysis or a periodogram, looking for periodicities in those residuals. And you see this remarkable peak of 1.94 days, telling us that there's a third periodicity in those data. In addition to the two periodicities due to two planets, there's a third planet. And so its period is very short, even shorter than four days. And uh, this shows it blown up, just examining the residuals themselves. Here's the velocity residual. They go up and down, clearly showing this third planet. But the amplitude is very low. You see it's less than 10 meters per second, more like 5 or 6 meters per second, plus or minus. So this is a very low mass planet. And you can easily calculate with Newton's laws of physics that the planet must have a mass of about 7.5 times the mass of the Earth. So you can see, as Michel Mayor mentioned, our Doppler precision is improving over the years, slowly approaching the point where we can detect planets that are not quite as small as the Earth, but almost. So we're getting very close to planets that might be not gaseous, but rocky. We can't be sure yet. Here's an artist's uh, rendering of the planet. Here's the star, uh, Gliese 876. And then here's the planet. Probably this planet has one hemisphere that's roasting hot, uh, blowtorched by the heat from the star. And then the backside of the planet would be cold. We don't know how cold. And then depending on how much atmosphere there is on the planet to circulate heat around, there might be a domain halfway in between that has a temperature that's lukewarm, perhaps the right temperature for water to be in liquid form, not just ice or steam. So there's a chance that these close-in planets might have water on them, but we certainly don't know at all at this stage. So uh, there's a movie of this system with three planets. Here's the movie. There's the outer Jupiter. Here's the second Jupiter. And then the inner planet with seven and a half Earth masses is right in there very close. And again, the mystery is how much, if any, atmosphere it has. It needs a little atmosphere, probably, 
to serve as a safe harbor for life, but it might have too much atmosphere. Uh, it might be more like Neptune with a thick atmosphere. So we just don't know at this stage the, the chemical composition and the atmospheric uh, physics of these planets. So now I'd like to move to a different topic. I'd like to talk a little more speculatively about the prospects of life existing on any of these planets and what sort of environments you would need for life to exist. And I'll start with our universe. Whoops, I meant to go forward. Let's see if I can. Yes. I'll remind you that our universe has galaxies in it, uh, spiral and elliptical galaxies. And these galaxies, as you know, contain some 100 billion stars. We, of course, live in the Milky Way galaxy, it's 100,000 light years across, and it has 200 billion stars or so. What I find wonderful about our Milky Way galaxy and about the entire universe is the fact that the laws of physics and chemistry, gravity, electricity and magnetism, quantum mechanics, are the same at one end of the galaxy, 100,000 light years over to the other end. The laws that you learn in your classes are the laws that would apply uh, f over the full length of our galaxy and almost certainly over the whole universe. That suggests that the properties of the Earth that we enjoy here will be the same as the properties on another Earth-like planet, maybe an Earth-like planet 50,000 light years away. And in particular, chemistry and even biochemistry might be the same. The same organic molecules will persist. Not just water, but amino acids and proteins will have the same structure from one end of the Milky Way to the other. That gives us hope that biology might be the same on different planets. But here we can't be sure. And the reason is that we have no equations for biology. There's not a single equation you can write down about biology that will definitely apply to a planet 50,000 light years away. Perhaps the biology there is completely different. So we have a problem. And I would like to point out three primary questions in biology that at least seem so fundamental that until we can answer them, we won't know whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. The first question is whether or not life depends on liquid water elsewhere. We know that here on the Earth, wherever you find liquid water, you seem to find life. But is that always the case? Could life thrive on some other solvent besides water? Uh, what about the replicating molecule that serves as the code, the information to pass along the generations? Could there be another organic molecule besides DNA and RNA that can serve as the code of life? Perhaps yes. And if so, life might be very different on another planet. We just don't know. Is DNA the only molecule that can provide that information? And then finally, I think we wonder whether or not Darwinian evolution always leads toward big brains, uh, an ability to play chess and, um, and to write uh, musical uh, symphonies and so on. Is, is the brain power that we humans cherish, is that a common outcome of evolution or instead, could it be that we smart humans represent just some twig on the evolutionary tree? Not the top, but just some little branch. We don't know. And if we're just a little twig, maybe we humans have a rare attribute of our brains and our ability to speak and to uh, type on a computer keyboard. So these are questions about biology that we don't have answers to. And of course, everybody wants the answer. In fact. When we found our first two planets right here, Time magazine did not put the planets at the top of the headline. Instead, when we found planets, the headline was, is anybody out there? So people really want to know not whether there's planets there. They really want to know, are there any other creatures out there like us that we can talk to? So that's a key question. And of course, we are ignorant about the answer, because the only life we've ever found in the universe is right here on the Earth. We have not found any life elsewhere. Now, this means, of course, that we should look elsewhere. And as you all know, we are looking within our solar system first to find life. 
the planet that has the best chance of harboring life, either now or in the past, is of course Mars. Um, as you know, we have two rovers on Mars right now crawling around the surface. The Europeans have an orb orbiting satellite taking high resolution pictures. But so far, while there's good evidence that water did exist on Mars in the past, there's no evidence that life has ever existed on Mars. Perhaps there's fossil evidence that we have not yet found. Perhaps there's life there now on Mars underneath the surface in the aquifers beneath the permafrost. But frankly, I wouldn't put a bet. Uh, I wouldn't bet very much money that there's life on Mars now. And I wouldn't even bet that there has ever been life on Mars. Maybe, but it doesn't look like a great place for the hundred million years you need for life to develop a cell wall, a cell membrane, and to replicate. You could also look for life elsewhere in our solar system. Jupiter, of course, the biggest planet in our solar system, probably cannot support life because it's a big ball of gas. But there are moons, a lovely volcanic moon, Io, but also the moon Europa that has a crust of ice beneath which is an ocean of liquid water. So it could be that life could be swimming in that ocean beneath the crust of Europa. And of course, the uh, Americans, the Europeans, Japanese, hopefully the Chinese will all help building spacecraft to go to Europa and drill in the ice, sense the uh, composition of the water below the ice, perhaps even doing biology experiments in that water to see if any uh, creatures have developed down there. And then, of course, you might wonder, could there be life on Saturn? Here again, I'm pessimistic. Saturn is a big ball of gas. The rings are just rocks uh, and ice. The moon around Saturn, however, is very interesting. You've all heard of Titan. Titan is a moon with an atmosphere, and it has liquids flowing on the surface. However, the liquids are not made of water, but rather methane and ethane. So one wonders, could it be that life could thrive not depending on water, but some other liquid? It's possible. And so it would be very interesting in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years to send a spacecraft to Titan and have it land on the surface and sample the surface for any signs of replicating molecules. OK, so now I'd like to launch ourselves out of the solar system and discuss the possibilities of life elsewhere in our Milky Way galaxy. So leaving our Milky Way galaxy, <coughs> let me remind you of its properties. Our Milky Way has 200 billion stars. It's a big place. We now know that about 10% of all the stars you see in the night sky have at least a Jupiter and a Saturn. Probably a larger fraction than 10% have Earth-like planets. But to be conservative, let's suppose that out of the 200 billion stars, 10% of them have planets. That means that in our Milky Way galaxy, there are 20 billion planetary systems, an enormous number of chances for life. Now, what are the chances that life might thrive? Well, you first need an Earth for a, a life to thrive. Probably Jupiter's and Saturn's are no good. So what kind of Earths? What are the properties of these Earths? How many of those Earths are warm enough to have liquid water? Well, it turns out that life can thrive in almost any condition as long as there is liquid water, as we see here on the Earth. And in fact, if you want to do the best experiment about the hospitality of the Earth and the various climates on the Earth, one of the best places to look for some very harsh conditions to see if life can still persist is to go to Yellowstone in the United States. Some of you may have been to Yellowstone. It's a wonderful national park. It has geysers. The water is boiling hot coming out of the ground. In the winter, it snows about five meters of snow above your head. So the temperature of Yellowstone goes from boiling to freezing on the surface. And then to top it all off at Yellowstone, there is sulfuric acid everywhere. The water is acidic with a pH of about 2 on a scale of 0 to 14. So it's an amazingly 
hideous place for life, hot water, cold temperatures, and acid. And yet, when you look in the hot springs, and in fact, uh, this is one of the best of them, you see the hot water coming off, and you notice all of the colors. Red, brown, yellow, green, even some blue. Each of those colors represents a different species of bacteria. Each has a different color, and they thrive in a specific range of temperature. So as the water comes off and cools, different bacteria thrive and are easily evident to your naked eye by the colors. You can analyze these under a microscope, as I'll show you in a few minutes. On top of the boiling water is the fact that it's acidic. And I was curious to see if I could detect this myself, so I brought pH paper with me when I visited Yellowstone, uh, as if I were an amateur biologist. And there I, I have the pH paper. I dunked it into the water. And you can indeed measure that the pH is about 2, 2 and a half. So it's very acidic. And I, I measured it in many places. Despite that, look at this beautiful filamentous bacteria here actually growing in that high acidity water. So it's a spectacular demonstration that life can thrive almost under any conditions as long as you have water. Here's my favorite. This is called churning cauldron. You can see the water is boiling. You don't want to go anywhere near that water. And so as a result, I took the pH paper. This is my wife, Susan Kegley. We took the pH. I let her put the pH paper in there. No, actually. <laughs> see, you're, you're glad that I don't take you to Yellowstone. <laughs> Michelle Mayor's wife is very happy right now that she married the right person. Uh, <laughs> so this is the pH paper. We attached it to a clip and then a string, and we tossed the pH paper into churning cauldron. And uh, here's what we saw. Oops. See if I can go back to it. Here's the, uh, the string, the clip, the pH paper. It's, again, red. You see the pH is 2. And almost as if to laugh at we humans, stuck to the string. Can you see what's stuck to it? There was algae in the water, despite the pH of 2 and the boiling conditions that you can still see back there. So it was just incredible to be an amateur and still demonstrate the uh, proliferation, the thriving life forms in that uh, pond uh, just by yourself. So of course, many biologists have studied these extremophiles, as they're called. And here you see some pictures of them, critters that are uh, microscopic that live at temperatures way above that which we humans would be comfortable at, 60 centigrade. And I think uh, Zygogonium actually thrives at 70 degrees Celsius. So there are many such critters. And the, their message, even though they can't talk, is very clear. Their message is extreme life thrives no matter what the temperature, no matter what the acidity, even uh, if they can't find obvious food, they still somehow thrive. They don't need sunlight to thrive. And so the bottom line is any planet out there in the universe that has liquid water, even if the acidity is high, or by the way, if the acidity is low, a very alkaline uh, setting also allows bacteria to thrive. Still, if you have liquid water, you probably get life. So this is a remarkable demonstration right here on the Earth that those rocky planets that must certainly be out there, yet to be discovered, admittedly, those planets, no matter what their conditions, if they have water, which is one of the most common molecules in the universe, they will therefore have the conditions for life, almost certainly. At least we can be optimistic. So that leads to one last question I'd like to address today. And that is, OK, perhaps primitive life is common in the universe. But what about intelligent life? What about uh, creatures that can build computers and spaceships? Well, you can estimate crudely what the possibilities are for the number of intelligent species in our Milky Way galaxy. And here's the way you would do the estimation. Our galaxy is 10 billion years old, twice the age of the Earth, only 4.6 billion years old. So you might get, ask, how many civilizations could there be in our Milky Way galaxy. 50% of the stars are older than the sun. And uh, so therefore, many of the stars and planets in our galaxy are older than the Earth 
and our own sun. So that means that life, once it starts, has billions of years to evolve, even beyond the amount of time we've had here on the Earth to evolve, 4.6 billion years. And so when you ask how many intelligent civilizations out there, you can do this calculation. 20 billion planetary systems, half of them are older than the Earth, so life could have evolved up to the point where we humans are. And then, of course, you are faced with one final question. Out of all the planets that start with some kind of life and have a few billion years to evolve, what fraction of them actually evolves intelligence among the species? Well, the most pessimistic people I've spoken to say that once you have primitive life, at least one in a million times, the life will evolve into intelligent life. One in a million is very low probability, but even if the chances are so small, one in a million, well then, of course, out of 20 billion of them, one in a million still tells you there will be thousands of civilizations in our Milky Way galaxy. And not just any old civilizations. They will have aged. They will be older than us, at least half of them will, maybe by thousands or millions of years. And so these civilizations would be advanced. It actually is a, a very interesting question, which I won't go into. The oldest stars have very little heavy elements in them. But ever since the first one or two billion years of our galaxy, most of the stars have a chemical composition similar to that of our sun. So probably uh, something like a few thousand stars are out there that could have had planets, do have planets, could have evolved life, did evolve life, and then one in a million chance that you get intelligence. You would expect thousands of these advanced civilizations. This is not new. Every science fiction writer, every uh, TV or, or a movie producer that's made a science fiction film has assumed exactly this same calculation. We've seen in Star Wars and Star Trek that our galaxy, in their opinion, is teeming with advanced civilizations. The place is actually almost crowded with spacecraft, as far as you can tell from the science fiction writers. You almost need stoplights out there to keep track of all the spacecraft. So this is the assumption that most of us have, that the science fiction writers have. But I'm not sure that this conclusion is correct. And here's why. If the galaxy is teeming with advanced civilizations, where are they? Why haven't they come and visited or made themselves obvious somehow? For example, the moon has sat there for 4.6 billion years. We have left our footsteps on the moon but nobody else has left any footsteps on the moon. And there's no erosion on the moon. So it's not, I think it's a fairly important non-detection that no one else planted a flag or put a transmitter or put a camera facing the Earth to watch us. No one did that on the moon. Same thing for Mars and the Earth. There's no evidence of an obelisk on Mars. Maybe they've left tiny transmitters that we haven't detected yet, but in Four or five billion years, no civilization came and visited Mars. And of course, even more dramatically, no advanced uh, alien species came and put a golf course on the Earth, or a resort hotel, or some place to visit or explore. I find it interesting that this lovely planet Earth with liquid water and oases and tropical forests, no one has come and left any trace of their having explored the Earth. So these are non-detections that are not definitive, but they're interesting. Furthermore, we professional astronomers are using hundreds of professional telescopes every night, looking into the random places. We have not yet, at least among we professionals, we have not yet gotten even one picture of a UFO, an alien spacecraft. So while some people believe in UFOs, professional scientists have found zero. So if they're out there, how could they avoid our telescopes? Another non-detection. And we don't see any uh, gamma ray uh, emission from a matter-antimatter engine like you saw on Star Trek. Uh, there aren't any robotic probes orbiting the Earth or the Moon or Mars. 
So if aliens had come even robotically, we would know about them, but apparently they didn't. So I think this is an interesting set of non-detections. Whoops. And the most dramatic non-detection is the explicit searches for extraterrestrial intelligence that have picked up no signs of intelligent species with their radio telescopes over the last 40 years. So I'm beginning to wonder, I think all of us should wonder, whether or not the galaxy is truly teeming with intelligent life. The density, if you will, of intelligent life might not be as high as we had thought and that the science fiction writers thought. So where are they all? I think there's a problem. And I would just put forth a hypothesis that we can't prove. Perhaps these thousands of civilizations, uh, which should be fairly close, 100 light years away or so, 1,000 light years away, maybe they're not so close. Maybe there aren't so many civilizations. And it could be that, in fact, our hypothesis, our original one, is wrong, that there are not so many advanced species. Now, of course, one possibility to explain the absence of advanced civilizations is that they, they have to last. If you have 1,000 civilizations over 5 billion years, those 1,000 civilizations spring up. But then they have to last for at least a million years or more to overlap the next civilization. And then that civilization has to last a million years to overlap the next civilization. Suppose technological civilizations don't last a million years. After all, we humans have been around technologically for only about 100 years. We've had radio for 100 years. We have a challenge to last a million years to overlap the next advanced civilization. And it could be that they simply don't last, that they actually come and destroy themselves. Maybe civilizations with technology are challenged to last as long as the next incoming civilization. So I think there's a, a challenge that we humans face to try desperately to take care of our Earth, to take care of the species here on the Earth as well as we humans, to preserve ourselves so that we perhaps can overlap and communicate with the next civilizations out there. So to finish my talk, the good news, amongst the possible bad news you just heard from me, the good news is that the answer to this question is beginning to emerge. We do know that there are petri dishes for life. The periodic table is well represented. There's liquid water. There's plenty of energy. Certainly, primitive life, uh, uh, elementary life, is abundant in our Milky Way galaxy. But uh, intelligent life, we can't say for sure. Um, it is likely the case that there's primitive life, but intelligent life is yet to be detected. And maybe we need SETI to pick up radio and TV signals from a Run Run Shaw that's out there somewhere broadcasting his TV station in our direction. Um, but at the moment, while primitive life is probably common, intelligent life we don't know and may be more rare than, than we had thought. So we can only hope that uh, with technology developed worldwide, perhaps someday we will be able to detect intelligent life, or maybe we'll be just stuck with s detecting semi-intelligent life. <laughs> and that won't, be, that won't be so bad after all. So I'll stop there. Thank you. We can now entertain questions from, all, from the audience. Hi, Professor. Um, if you have a chance to find a planet that have an um, environment similar to our Earth, then what's next? Um, what should we do? And yeah. If I'll repeat the question. The question is, if we find an environment, if we find a planet that has an environment similar to Earth, what do you do next? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but let me make something up off the top of my head. Um, of course, if, you, if we've done enough experiments in our Earth, begin our revolution in another star, and we by chance fly Earth. So yes, I, let me make sure I understand your question. The question is, could it be that life started on a planet around another star yeah. and somehow traveled to the Earth, yeah. and so that we are the aliens? <laughs> and there, there is. Um, 
Actually, th that is possible. We now know that uh, planets can exist, uh, biology can start, and then an impact can occur from an asteroid or a comet. And when the asteroid or comet hits the surface of that planet, there will be ejecta that will fly off, achieving escape velocity, and it will just travel ballistically uh, in, you know, in, in, with constant velocity uh, for very long distances. And people have uh, learned that organic molecules can survive in the cold, dark reaches of outer space for thousands or millions of years. Basically, a single-celled organism, when frozen, will just remain intact during the entire journey from that other star to the Earth. So it is possible that we here on the Earth are the offspring, uh, you know, the children of some other uh, civilization somewhere else. We only have time for one more question after this one. Well, Professor, uh, uh, what uh, we have just discussed, I think, uh, is very uh, fantastic about the aliens and the intelligence. But I think we should discuss something uh, very realistic. You know, uh, <laughs> though our spacecraft is very advanced today, we can carry only very little mass to right. the other stars with very much energy. So, um, how do you think about this question and how we overcome this challenge about the message limit? Uh, you, you know, there is a limit uh, uh, of, carrying, uh, of carrying the gas per, uh, per energy. How do you think about this question? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And I'll just re-emphasize, your question is going to be better than any answer I will provide you with. Um, you can easily calculate the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, required to carry, let's say, 1 kilogram uh, from the Earth to a nearby star 5 light years away. And moving at, let's say, a hundredth of the speed of light that kinetic energy, it's not even, doesn't even require relativity, that kinetic energy is equivalent to the amount of energy we use here on the Earth in about a year. So in other words, a spectacular amount of energy is required to take a, a one kilogram payload and take it to the stars. So we clearly need some other propulsion mechanism, as you said in your question. We can't do it with chemical rockets. Even nuclear uh, energy is really not sufficient because nuclear engines have to carry the nuclear fuel with them, and that makes the requirement for even more mass. So really, the best possibilities that I've heard of, and I'm not an expert, is to use perhaps something more exotic, like solar energy, a big sail that catches the sunlight and, and it uses the solar uh, photons and uses the momentum from them and actually moves, goes off into space. Um, Accelerated. I guess that's me going off into space. Um, <laughs> another possibility uh, is to use the hydrogen gas that exists between the stars and use the hydrogen as you go, scooping it up and using it as fuel for a fusion engine. But basically, your question, as I say, is, is an important point. Uh, designing, conceiving, and building a propulsion system that can take us to the stars, that is to say, take a, pay, a small payload to the stars, is not trivial. We'll need some very brilliant engineers to design such a system. Okay, we can take one last question. Professor, um, I think this question may be a little bit far away, but um, I do really, really want to know um, how do you feel, um, how do the living being, how the human being to be prevent uh, self-destructive in, in the development of civilization? Yeah. So how, what should a scientist or even a physicist should do? to prevent such uh, self-destructive in development. Are you, are you asking how can we scientists prevent our self-destruction? What, should we, do? what <laughs> should we do? At least, I, I know this a little bit far away, but I will, personally, I would think that in this new era, we should start to consider this question. Yes. 
Not well, for us, but for our children. I'll tell you what I think is my best answer to your very... His question, as I understand it, is how can we all uh, enhance the survival of humanity here on the earth for as long as possible? And, you know, I can only give you my own personal answer to that, not as a scientist, but just as a human being. I think the most important thing we need to do is to make sure that children uh, travel to different countries and exchange. We need to have American children go to China, Chinese children go to America, all of us go to Europe, to Africa, the Middle East. And if we have young people learning that basically all of us humans are the same, we all want to live good lives, we all, all want to have enough food to eat, we want to take care of our own children, the next generation. So the most important thing we can do is to communicate better with each other and uh, share knowledge, share resources. That may help us survive longer. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor Master. Uh, may I emphasize that HAUSD is one of the largest exchange programs in Asia. <laughs> so I would like to invite our students to go on and uh, the exchange program to uh, uh, understand uh, the cultures, I mean, of the world. Um, at this moment, I would like to thank uh, Professor Marcy again for the, uh, his brilliant lecture. I would also like to thank, uh, thank Professor uh, Mayor for the lecture.